Hebrews 9, 27. As it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. There's probably not too many daddies in here that can't relate to this if you have daughters. Having gone through this with two girls, it's always been fun for me to aggravate daddies with girls. I give Kyle a rough time. Now I am one of them's happily married off. I remember giving Ken Thomas the same. And you know, Ken was so funny. Be no boys coming to my house. And that Olson just got married a few months ago. I looked around on the internet and it amazed me. And you've got to keep in mind the concept or ideal of dating is different now. I remember when Austin and and probably Tyler too and and then Aiden come in and talking about somebody they were dating. Aiden's what, 12 years old? (laughs) Talking about somebody who's dating. You got to remember we are so social now in our in our lives that dating now is almost like If you're texting with some girl, you're dating her. And I found out that now, young girls, 11, 12 years old, are dating. Reminds me again how old-fashioned I am. Some of you all are familiar with Ken Davis. He is a Christian comedian. He's one of my favorites. There's a lot of them out there, and they're great. Ken Davis is one of my favorites. Dr. Dobson has had him on many times. He's been a frequent speaker at our Southern Baptist Convention. And Ken Davis has this unique ability to have you just rolling in the aisles. I mean, you're busting your gut laughing. He is so funny. And he's got kind of this dry delivery. It's kind of like listening to Bob Newhart make jokes. Ken Davis is kind of that way. I love him. He'll have you just cracking up in the next minute. He'll have you crying. Because he'll relate to you some deep spiritual point. God has gifted him in so many ways. I remember listening, and this will tell you how how long ago it's been, I had it on a a cassette tape. (laughs) I remember listening to something that I had got from Dobson. And his daughter at this time, it's been years ago, she's probably married now. His daughter at that time was right around 13, 14. And she was starting to talk about boys. And he being old school told her, he said, well, honey, I tell you what, when you get 30, we'll talk about this dating thing. That didn't work. So he says, I've got this thing figured out. 
Guys, dads, I've got it figured out. Here's what you do. When that first young man comes over, you go down, you meet him at the door, you pull out your gun, and that gets worse. He said, just shoot him. <laughs> just shoot him. And just leave his lifeless, bleeding body there on the front porch. He said, other boys will come over and they'll see that and they'll say, there ain't no girl worth that. They'll take care of it. I entitled the message this morning, Are You Ready for Your Date? It has nothing to do with anything that I've talked about so far. It's much more serious. Much more. Because in our text, one of the most familiar verses in the Bible, in our text, the writer of Hebrews reminds us that each of us have a date. He calls in an appointment. And I promise you it's one we'll keep. Are you ready for your date? I wrote down two or three things. It begins with a declaration. A declaration. If you look at this verse, you'll realize this is a very, very forceful statement. Because the writer in Essos reminds us that every single one of us is going to die. Every one of us. We just don't know when. But every one of us is going to die. In fact, if you believe Scripture and believe anything about God, who in His omniscience knows everything, you know that God already knows when that date is. He knows. The Scripture says that He knows the length of our days. That's how many. God knows when we came into this world. For me, today's my birthday. It was several years ago. He knows when we came into this world. And he knows when we'll leave it. That is a very, very forceful statement. Strong declaration. Second, not only a declaration, but there are discoveries when you think about death. You see, there's some things that people who die realize that they didn't realize before. You have to die to realize these things. Number one, there will be a continuation. I scarcely say the large majority of the world today believes that when you die, that's it. It's just over. It's over. The percentage of people that do not believe in a hereafter, that there is some sort of existence after death, that number is growing. We happen to live in an area, this Bible Belt area, that have been taught, and I thank God for it, that have been taught that death is not the end. But for those people 
who somehow have come to follow this concept or ideal that when you die, that's it. You just cease to be. It's over. There's going to be a rude awakening. When we breathe our last breath on this earth, our next breath will be in eternity somewhere. There is a continuation. And if anyone tries to tell you otherwise, don't you listen. Don't you believe it. Life goes on after this life. There's a continuation. Second, there's a consciousness. There's a consciousness. By that I mean when we pass from this life, we will have full memory. I look forward to that because I don't have full memory now. I'm looking forward to that. When we pass from this life, we will have total recall. We'll remember every sermon that we ever heard. We'll remember each opportunity that we had to be saved. I believe we'll even remember those people who were so faithful to witness to us and tell us about Jesus. And obviously we have moved now more to a place of someone who dies unsaved. Can you imagine how horrible it will be to wake in eternity separated from God and remember everything that happened on this earth? Particularly in light of the fact that you'll be in suffering and be in pain and you'll remember when that old preacher stood up and you thought he was such an old fogey. Warned you. Warned you about being saved and having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, you'll awaken in hell. You'll remember that. You'll remember that. I've often thought we talk about fire and we talk about pain and all those things associated with hell and the people that are there. I've often thought probably the worst thing about hell will be that we'll take our memory with us and we'll remember all of the chances we had to not be there. but we'll also know it's too late. Which brings us to the third point. There's a consignment. A consignment. When you look at the very familiar story of the rich man and Lazarus, both of them died, but they went to two different places. Lazarus, Awakened in Father Abraham's bosom, which is a type of paradise. The rich man who had no time for God, he had too many other endeavors going on. When he died, he awoke in hell. And there's every indication in that story that he knew where he was and he knew he was there forever. Forever. And I've often thought, you know, if this could be like the penal system or something like that, you just go in, you serve your time, and then you get out. After you served your time. Maybe even the governor may give you a pardon. You may get out sooner. But hell isn't that way. No. 
No. When people awake in hell, they will know where they are and they'll know they're there forever. Forever. That's horrible. It's a horrible thought. So there is a declaration, a very, very forceful one. We're all going to die. There are discoveries. There's things that we will not find out until we do die. Here's the last point. And for this morning, I think it's the most important one. There is a decision. There's a decision. There's a choice to be made. And that choice is yours. And there was a point in my life when it was mine. I can't make it for you. I promise you, irregardless of how well I know you, some of you I have known for a long time. Some of you it's been more recent. But if you have never put your trust in Jesus Christ, and it were possible for me to make that choice for you, I would do it. I would do it. But I can't make it for you. I can't make it for you. You may have a godly mom and dad. You may have godly grandparents. You may have godly children. Siblings. And they really love you. And it bothers them. That by your own testimony, you're not ready to meet Christ. It bothers them. It should. They can't make that choice for you. They can't. My mama faithfully took me to church. And I'm grateful for that. And there's people all over this house that share that sentiment with me. You're grateful that at least one of your parents, and that was the case with me, until my dad was saved later in life, at least one of your parents took you to church. Is church the only place you can be saved? No. No. But I can tell you one thing, it's a good place to be saved. You're in the right place if you're lost. I am thankful to God that my mama took me to church and I got saved one Sunday evening. But my mama couldn't make that choice for me. She couldn't. If she could have, she would. But she couldn't. Neither can yours. It's a choice that you must make. Are you ready? Are you ready for your date? My intention is, is not to bring you down this morning. No. My an, on, uh, honest reason this morning is to make you aware of what I believe is the most important decision you'll ever make in life. And that's to choose Christ. Because it has everlasting ramifications. Elena, Amber, let's sing a verse this morning.